We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Great to see you all. To our moms, happy Mother's Day. A uh, real quick shout out to the best mom that I know. You might be thinking I'm talking about my mom, but no, I'm talking about my wife. Uh, my, my wife. T- Happy Mother's Day, Melissa. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all the, the moms, mom figures, grandmoms, uh, future moms, all of you. You're just so such a wonderful part of our uh, community, our society, our families. We're really glad that you exist, so thank you. Uh, we are in a series called This Means War. That, that bumper is a bit intense, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to be talking about the war that is being waged on our families today. And just a a little bit of a warning, some of the themes of my message uh, are mature. And so just uh, for families with young kids in the room, that's your warning, all right? Uh, First, before we get into it, didn't Pastor Reed last week just do a great job kicking us off? Those of you who are here. Uh, He's back in Arizona preaching at his church this morning, but Pastor Reed, thank you so much for for teaching, kicking off that series. I think my favorite takeaway from the message last week is that it's so important for us in this war that's being waged on on us as as a group of believers is that we have to be so careful to balance truth with love and truth with grace in our conversations we have. Because if, you, if you're honest, this is like the weirdest war of all time. Because oftentimes when you look at the other side of the enemy lines, the people that are there are the enemy, right? But in this case, the people that seem to be at odds with our values, at odds with God's word, at odds with what we know to be true, uh, we have to be very careful to remember they're not the enemy, The Bible's really clear about this in Ephesians 6, right? It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. In fact, what's so weird about this war is the people that often seem like they're the enemy, seem like they're at odds with our values. Uh, In in this case, we're not trying to harm them. We're not trying to kill them. We're not trying to attack them with aggression. We're actually trying to, to win them over to our side, right? We're trying to show love and introduce them to truth. So it's like the weirdest war of all time because the enemy isn't who the enemy seems to be. Our enemy is Satan. And, and the, right, according to this verse, if you keep reading, right, it says our enemy is not the flesh and blood enemy. It's against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You see, Satan has three goals. It says in John 10 that he wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. He is out. It is war. War has been declared. And so we're going to take some time over this series to explore some of the places that the war is happening. And today specifically, I want to focus on the war on family. The war on family. Now, first, let me, uh, just to set the stage to make sure we can all agree that there is a war going on right now, that families are under attack, here's a few statistics for us this morning. First one is this. You know that 50% of the marriages in this country end in divorce. And unfortunately, that's not a much better statistic when you, you take Christian families and put them into the mix. Two people who've made a promise that no matter what, they're going to be with each other until death. of the time, that doesn't happen. How about this? More than one-third, it's actually closer to 50% right now, of children are born outside of wedlock in the United States. 40% of children are being raised in cohabitating relationships instead of being raised by married parents. 34% of kids live in a situation where they don't have a father in the home. 34%. 
Changing this perspective a little bit, how about this? You know, the global birth rate in the last 70 years has been cut in half. We're having half as many children today as we were 70 years ago, even though the, God's word tells us to be fruitful and multiply. Here's another statistic that shows that our families are under attack. You know, over 2,000 babies per day are killed through legal abortion on the altar of preference. 2,000 per day. Here's my point, and you might have a hard time maybe connecting those things uh, to, to the, the concept of being a war on our families, but the truth is there is a war going on, and we need to open up our eyes to it and see it. I have a theme I'd kind of like to, to, to balance everything out today, to kind of tie all my points together today. How many of you have read Sun Tzu's The Art of War? Any of you read The Art of War? Well, one thing, if you, if you read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, let me get, tell you a little bit about Sun Tzu. He, he was a Chinese general born even before Jesus, all right? So he's not a recent general. This is way back when he was known to be kind of a master of warfare. When he would go out as a general and fight in a war, he would come back victorious. And so he took the things that he learned on how to win a war, and he put them in a book called The Art of War, and what's interesting is you can take a lot of the principles from Sun Tzu's successful victories and you can compare them to the way Satan is waging war against your family and you actually see that it lines up really cleanly. That Satan is very strategic. He's very clever. It would be, uh, it would be silly for you to assume that Satan doesn't have a plan and that he's not very smart. He's very clever and he is attacking your family as we speak. And one of the things that Sun Tzu says is that the very first thing in warfare is that you don't attack the enemy directly. You attack first their strategy. The very first thing you want to attack is you want to figure out how is the enemy planning on, on fighting? What are they planning on doing? How are they going to go to battle? How many people are coming? What time? All, you figure out their whole plan, and then you're going to attack not them, but their strategy first. That's the first thing. And so it's really interesting, right, that war starts with strategy. And that goes both ways. If we are in a war, we have to understand Satan's strategy so that we can attack it. But we also have to understand that Satan knows God's strategy for building societies, for building the kingdom of God, and that all of it is kind of tied into this thing we call the nuclear family. That Satan understands that if families are healthy, the gospel spreads, that people are healthy, churches thrive. So if he can destroy the family, he can do a ton of damage. And so we got to understand that war starts with strategy. Satan's number one target, I would argue, is to destroy the family. Because if he can destroy the family, he ruins individuals, he ruins societies, he ruins churches. If he can destroy the family. So we got to open up our eyes and recognize there's a war going on right now. And it's targeted at the family. Now you've probably... Uh, heard me use this phrase, nuclear family. Well, let me, let me share with you why I think that's such a cool phrase to use to describe and what, what a nuclear family is. First, let, let's look at the first strategy that Satan employs to destroy families. The first strategy, step number one, is this thing called infiltration. He wants to get into your family, infiltrate ideas and philosophies and, and thoughts and, and so-called truths into your family so that he can and do some damage. And right from Sun Tzu's Art of War, this is really kind of one of the first steps. You want to sneak some things into the family. There's a, uh, this concept, right, of nuclear family. What does nuclear family mean? Does that mean that your family glows a little bit when the lights turn off? <laughs> right? That's not what it means. Right? A nuclear family, we've always understood historically, right? It's it's a, a, a dad and a mom living together with their children in the home. It's just a, a traditional understanding of what a family looks like, a nuclear family, the way it was designed to be by God when he created the family. 
Now, here's why I love that we use the word nuclear when we describe this kind of family. Any of you ever study nuclear physics? Some nuclear physicists may be in the room, right? And you can correct me later if I get this wrong, but there's a kind of a building block of all things that are made. Uh, right? You could take anything and, and zoom in on it enough under a microscope and you're gonna get down to the thing, the building block of all created matter and we call that an atom, A-T-O-M, an atom. And in the atom, you have a nucleus, which is made up of uh, protons and neutrons. And then surrounding that are these electrons. And these, these atoms uh, are, are designed, uh, they're, they're meant to be stable. There's a certain number of electrons and protons and neutrons, and this whole thing was designed to have a lot of stability to it. But do you know, uh, what's interesting first, let's, who put all these atoms together? God did, right? Colossians 1.17 says, Christ existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So first and foremost, we know that God is the one who created this this system of, of nuclear physics and put these atoms together, just like God created the family. All right, but let's take this idea of an atom for just a moment. If you want to make an atom unstable, What you do is you have to infiltrate the nucleus of the atom, and you're going to throw some extra neutrons in there. You're going to put some extra things into the atom that aren't naturally supposed to be there. And what happens as a result, a couple things. One, the atom becomes unstable. It wants for all, everything it can to to regain stability. It's trying to get rid of the excess energy, and it expels the energy in the form of radiation. Can we all agree radiation is not a good thing? It causes problems. It ruins things, right? And so, and if it can't release the radiation, it can get to a place where it's unstable enough and unable to release this that it explodes and then releases the radiation through an explosion. That's pretty bad. And then that radiation, as it seeps into other atoms and does it, it causes damage to other atoms. It causes all sorts of problems. How cool is it that we call the family a nuclear family? Think about this for a moment. Mom and dad, a married couple, this is the nucleus of the family. The family is the atom, okay? The nucleus of the family is your, is your marriage, and then you have these electrons circling around, just like little kids do, right? These are your children, and God designed these atoms to be stable, to, to not have any extra neutrons worked into the nucleus of the family, and, and everything's meant to be healthy. But what Satan's strategy is, is to infiltrate your family with unnatural outside influence to cause instability, to cause you to, 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 to explode, to cause you to do damage to other family units around you. You're, you know the families you most often do damage to? are your, your children's families, these generational issues that we pass along. We, we let Satan infiltrate our atom of our family, and then it causes so much damage that the damage goes on for generations. You see, Satan's first step in his strategy to destroy your family is to infiltrate the, the, the nucleus of your family, to add extra things in there, neutrons or protons or electrons, to create a a system that is not stable, that is going to do damage internally and then do damage externally. That's Satan's strategy. We have to understand that. Here's what Colossians says about this. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says, don't let anyone infiltrate your nucleus. Here's how he says it. Paul says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Don't let anyone sneak something, infiltrate the system of your family and create a system that is now unstable and unbalanced because it will cause damage. It will cause not only damage internally, but eventually you explode, you release the radiation, and you do damage to all these other families around you. You break apart a whole society. That's Satan's strategy. Here's the second step. 
And we get this also from Sun Tzu's The Art of War, right? You, after you infiltrate, uh, Sun Tzu says that next step is deception. Deception. Here's an exact quote from The Art of War. Sun Tzu says this, all warfare is based on what? Deception. All warfare is based on deception. He says, therefore, when your army is capable, you need to pretend that you're incapable. And when they are active, you need to pretend that you're not active. When you're really close by, when you're near, you need to make it appear that you are far away. And when you're far away, you need to make them think you're right next door. Essentially, Sun Tzu understands that if you're going to win a war, the enemy has to always believe that what is true is false and that what is false is true. You got to to mess with their minds. You got to deceive them. And I think we can all agree that Satan is a liar. The Bible makes it really clear. In fact, that's an exact quote from Scripture. Satan is a liar and he is the father of lies. He is a deceiver. And so what he wants to do is he wants to sneak in and deceive the world by getting us to believe things that are true are false and things that are false are true. He likes to take words that we've always known the definition of and redefine them. He's already infiltrated, so now he can start sneaking little lies in there to get us to believe things that aren't true. Let me give you a few of the words. I wrote down five words I know that relate to the family that Satan is trying to, to, to redefine. How about the word sexuality? That's the first one. Satan is trying to redefine the word sexuality. He's right, trying to redefine sex. He's trying to redefine what's, what's good and what's healthy. I'll give you a great example of that. Our world right now is trying its darndest to get you to believe that hookup culture is fun and safe and healthy. Every channel you turn on, every show pretty much you watch, every book and potty, I mean, whatever it is that that we're consuming, it seems as if just building up your body count and enjoying sexual relationships outside of God's plan for sexuality is somehow now good and fun and healthy and nobody gets hurt. Listen, that's a lie from Satan. God designed sex. He designed marriage. He designed the whole system of sexuality, and he designed it exactly the way it was designed or meant to be enjoyed. But Satan's trying to to take terms that we've always understood for thousands of years and redefine them. How about within sexuality, the, the concept of homosexuality? We've always understood you know, for, for a very long time, that the way God's system for building a family works, it's one man, one woman in marriage for life. That's God's design. It says in Hebrews 13, 4, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Let me say it again, what the truth is here. Satan wants you to believe that sexuality has a new definition But the truth is that God designed it, God designed sex, and it's great when used properly. One man, one woman, for life in marriage. That's the plan. Here's another thing Satan's trying to redefine right now, is he's trying to deceive, he's trying to infiltrate your nucleus with this other little bit of a lie. We've always known for thousands of years, until apparently just, what, 20 years ago, gender now has, what, a new definition. We've always understood what gender has meant. And now uh, we're, we're 20 years into this redefinition of the word. We got pronouns. I was watching a YouTube video where someone was out on the street asking people on college campuses, how many genders are there? Let me see how you guys would do on that test. How many genders are there? All right, that was great. You guys, you, guys, you figured it out, right? And these college students, one after another after another, one person answered, well, technically infinite. You know, it's a spectrum, and it's, it's really, you're not going to be able to find yourself. It's a spectrum, so it's, there's infinite number of genders. And this is that kind of redefinition that we're, we're seeing. Another, another type of gender redefinition is a concept of gender roles. 
the concept that men don't need women and women don't need men and that they're, they're completely interchangeable and that God didn't make us different. This is another way Satan's trying to redefine gender. Here's what God's word says about it in Genesis 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 2. It says, he created them male and female. There it is. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them human. So if you were in this, uh, this race of beings called humans, there are how many genders? Two, male and female. There it is. The truth is there are just two genders and they have distinct complementary roles within the family. Here's another thing Satan's trying to redefine is the concept of parenting and parent roles. What your responsibility as a parent, right now Satan is doing everything he can through the world to try to convince you to abdicate the throne that you have been given, the responsibilities that you've been given as a parent. There are a whole school boards out there right now that are trying to convince you that there's another set of adults that know more and, and, and know, understand more what's good for your kids than you do because you haven't been trained properly. You didn't go to the right classes, parents. You should just leave this to us. And listen, the truth is we've always understood, it's, it's something that we know deep down that God created you with the responsibility to be the primary discipler in your home. There shouldn't be an adult out there that knows secrets about your kid that they think, you know what, mom and dad just aren't suited to handle this. So we're gonna keep this internal. Parents should be the primary disciples of their children. That's the truth. Here's another thing that's trying, that Satan's trying to redefine is the word life. Life is trying to be redefined. I, uh, you know, the, it's really easy to, to be okay with certain things. If you can take the, the concept of baby and swap out the term baby with clump of cells. If I can get you to not see a baby anymore, but now to just see a clump of cell, can I just be honest with everyone in this room right now? Every single one of you in this room, you are, sorry, a clump of cells. You got more cells than, than uh, some of us have more cells than others, but all of us are essentially a clump of cells, but you are a clump of cells that have been made uniquely into a, a, a certain number of DNA. You are a human clump of cells. You are a live clump of cells. What Satan would love to do is in trying to destroy the family to try to convince us to, to kill our own children. Psalm 39 verse 15 says, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. David says that as I was woven together in the dark of the womb, he's explaining that the God was there building life. You see, the truth is that life begins at conception and ending that life prematurely is taking life, which you are not authorized to do. Here's another word that's being redefined. I, I could make a long, longer list for the sake of time. Let's just look at the word fidelity. Now, you might not know what the word fidelity means. It's just the opposite of infidelity. We all know what that one means, right? Satan would love for you to reconsider what it looks like to be faithful or unfaithful in your marriage. There's a billions of dollars spent every year trying to hook you and I, men and women, on pornography. Trying to convince us, hey, you know what? As long as you're just looking, it's just, it's just visual. There's no touching. There's no actual sex happening. This is fine. That's not cheating. It's not going to destroy your marriage. Just enjoy the pleasure that you see on the screen. There's whole industries right now actually encouraging infidelity. There's websites that people are encouraged to go to to explore uh, relationships outside of their marriage. There's a whole thing going on right now the, about uh, monogamy being something that's from the past and that now polyamory, enjoying many different people, even within marriage, invite someone else in, invite that computer screen into your marriage, invite another person into your marriage. That's nonsense and it's just Satan trying to redefine things, trying to make people believe things that are true are false and things that are false are true. You see, deception is the second step of his strategy, trying to deceive us. 
me share a, a really scary quote. This is from Mein Kampf, written by Adolf Hitler, okay? This is what Adolf Hitler says. You can get a little bit of a peek into his strategy. He says, by clever and persistent use of propaganda, even heaven can be represented as hell to the people and the most wretched life as paradise. What he's simply saying is if we're careful and we use a, a consistent propaganda and we, we lie creatively, we get it in there, we, we, we make people believe things that aren't, we, we can actually make people think that hell is a good place. And we can get people to believe that heaven is a bad place. We just have to be really sneaky about how we get the message out. See, Satan knows how to attack your family. And deception is one of the strategies he's going to use. I read this article this week. Um, and it was written by two guys who were essentially putting together a game plan. It's not a super long article. It's based on a book that they wrote. But essentially, it was an article called um, The Overhauling of Straight America. And the whole article was written by how do we take people who for thousands of years have always seen this uh, uh, heterosexuality as a normative, and how can we get them to accept homosexuality as, as an acceptable practice? How can we do that? How do we overhaul straight America? And they wrote this article, so this is obviously not coming from a biblical worldview, and here's what they said. They said, where we talk is important. The visual media... Film and television are plainly the most powerful image makers in Western civilization. The average American household watches over seven hours of TV daily. Those hours open up a gateway, listen to this, into the private world of straits through which a Trojan horse might be passed. As far as desensitization is concerned, the medium is the message of normalcy. If we can put something in front of uh, people's eyes enough and we can make it seem like this is a normal behavior, this is a normal thing, this is just the way life works, if we can put it in front of people enough, before we know it, everyone will accept it as acceptable, true, good. You see, Satan is very clever and the second step is to not only, you know, first step is to infiltrate, and the second step is to deceive and to get people to believe that what is good is bad and what is bad is good. You see, what, what happens when he does those two things is he can step into the third step, which is what I would call divide and conquer. If you can get people across the enemy lines to actually turn on each other and to divide into small groups. Now, instead of attacking one giant army, you just have to attack a whole bunch of small, weak armies with no organization or control. If you can get the enemy to divide itself, to really almost fight itself, then all you got to do is now attack it from all angles, all at once, and you will have divided them, and now you can conquer them. You see, I want you to understand here that Satan is attacking the family, not just from the north. He's not just attacking from the south. He's also attacking from the east and from the west and the southwest and the southeast and the north. He's attacking us from every angle because he's done a good job infiltrating. He's done a great job uh, deceiving. And now we're all divided. And so now he can get in there and just destroy us from every angle. Let me, let me show you some examples of how we're being attacked from all sides. I made a long list, so bear with me, all right? I'm gonna get a little political here in some of these. Uh, I normally don't do that. I just want you to try to see some of the ways the family is under attack. When the world redefines marriage to strip it of gender roles, they attack the family. How about this? When the world tries to convince women that they don't need men and vice versa, what they're really doing there is attacking the family. When the world attempts to normalize same-sex marriage, 
disregarding biblical sexuality and the natural process of reproduction, they attack the family. How about this? When a government passes laws that encourage and financially reward fatherlessness, they are attacking the family. When the world convinces you that hookup culture is normal and fun and healthy, I promise you what they're doing in that moment is they are attacking the family. When Hollywood tries to normalize promiscuity and and LGBTQ lifestyles, they are attacking the family. When our culture makes it okay for men to be boys, to act like boys, they're attacking the family. When schools propagate lies that boys can be girls and girls can be boys, I promise you, they are attacking the family. Are you getting the theme here? When the world supports the mutilation and sterilization of children's bodies, they are attacking the family. When the world dehumanizes a baby created in the image of God so that they can murder it with less guilt, they attack the family. When a culture treats abortion like an inconsequential form of birth control, they attack the family. When experts, here's another political one, all right? When experts try to convince you that having children will contribute to the collapse of our climate, they're attacking the family. When a couple voluntarily and for selfish reasons decides not to have children so they can pursue their own happiness, they attack the family. When a school board tries to tell parents that they are better suited to raise their children than the parents are, they attack the family. When a teacher or curriculum tells a student that they don't need to be obedient to their parents, when a non-parent adult is keeping physical, mental, or emotional health-related secrets from parents, When a world spends billions of dollars a year to get men and women hooked on pornography. They attack the family. How about one last one? When a culture tries to convince you that if you are unhappy in your marriage, you should leave it. They are attacking the family. You know what's interesting as I make a list like this, and this list could be much longer, all the different ways that we're being attacked You know, arrows, bullets, missiles are coming at families, a biblical family unit from all angles. One of the things that all these things have in common is this concept of hedonism. I don't know if you're aware of what hedonism is, but it's basically a belief system. It's a philosophy, a a behavioral system, right? A worldview that teaches that the ultimate purpose of life is to bring happiness to yourself and to avoid pain at all costs. Now, nobody will probably ever admit to being a hedonist. Most people know that it's not a good look to say, you know what, the whole purpose of my life is to make me happy and not to hurt, right? But that's the truth of our our human nature, our sin nature in each of us. That's what we're ultimately always running after. How can I make Matt happy and avoid anything that makes Matt sad? Like that's my human nature is to pursue life from that perspective. And what's interesting about this is that all of us have that same sin nature. We all have it deep down in us, this desire to uh, pursue happiness at whatever cost necessary and to avoid pain at whatever cost necessary. But scripture calls us as believers to something radically different than hedonism. Scripture actually tells you to die to yourself. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not going to pursue happiness as your ultimate goal and avoid pain as your ultimate goal. In fact, it actually says, right, in Matthew 16, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and then take up your cross and follow me. Do you see the two things you got to do before you follow Jesus? You got to give up your desire just to make you happy, and you got to take on the one thing that might bring you the most pain. 
If you want to be a follower of Jesus, it's the exact opposite of what the world teaches, what the, our natural instinct is, as humans in this world is to pursue this hedonism. We have to be careful to not let these ideas sneak in to our family. You see, in this war on family, Satan wants to infiltrate. He wants to deceive. Then he wants to divide and conquer. He wants to, ultimately, Satan wants you to follow your happiness. Jesus wants you to follow him. And so I have some, some statements I've put together for our what now, God, as we ask God right now in this moment, if you're in this room, I hope you're being sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to say, God, what do you want me to do with this information? Where, where am I under attack and I don't even realize it? Where are some weaknesses in the fortress that I've set up around my family? Where, where's the enemy sneaking in that I don't even know it right now? And so I want to encourage you on a few ideas on how we can fight this war against our families. Here's the first thing I want you to consider. And on the back of your notes, there's a what now God note section. You can write this down, write one of these down, three of these down, whatever. The first one is this. I want to encourage you to model healthy families and marriages. How great would it be if as a church, our marriages were the model that God designed in scripture? Because what would happen is as other families outside of the church, outside of faith, they're pursuing the world's definitions, their families are under attack, nothing's working, things aren't going the way they're supposed to. How great would it be when they're stuck in that brokenness, they look over into the families of the church and they say, I really want what they're having. That's what sounds much better than whatever it is we've been trying. This is what seems to work. And we can model healthy families and win people to, to our perspective and our worldview, the truth. How about number two? I want to encourage you to be intentional about what you consume. Maybe another way of thinking about this is to ask the question, what are you allowing into your home that needs to be cut off? What's coming in through the TV, through, through Spotify? What's coming in through social media that you're like, you know what, right now, I'm letting, this, I'm letting the enemy infiltrate my family. What needs to be cut off? Listen, we shouldn't expect a lost world to share our values but likewise, we shouldn't go to a lost world to, to find our value systems. Right. Number three, I want to encourage you to fellowship with like-minded believers. Here's why this is so important. You might think, well, what does that have anything to do with my family? Satan's, one of his, 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 his kind of battle plans within his strategy is to make you think that you're the only weirdo out there who believes the way you believe. If he can make you think that you're the, the standalone, bigot, racist, whatever, fill in the words, you're the, you're the odd person out and you're the hateful person while everyone else is over here just doing life lovingly, if he can make you think you're the weirdo, then he's, he's probably going to infiltrate and deceive and trick you and, and he's going to cause some damage. But when you get together with other believers and you recognize, hey, we actually stand together on this. We understand and interpret God's word properly in this area. We're not alone. Our family has is, is been designed by God to be a certain way, and we stand behind that together. Fellowship with like-minded belief. How about number four? I want you to know the truth so that you can spot the lies. You know, when people that work in Secret Service, see, I don't know if you knew this, but Secret Service is the one who handles currency counterfeiting and when they have experts who are learning how to spot counterfeits what they do is they don't actually grab a bunch of counterfeit currency and try to figure out what counterfeit feels like and looks like they, they actually study the real bill they, they look at the real money the real currency the real bill and they they look at it and they study it and they they handle it so much that when the fake thing comes across their desk, they know right away, this doesn't smell right, it doesn't look right, it doesn't feel right. What we can do as believers is we can know God's word so well 
that when something tries to infiltrate their way into the nucleus of your atom, of your family, you can know right away, huh? This doesn't pass the sniff test. This isn't making it. This doesn't belong. Know the real stuff. Know the truth so you can spot the lies. Number five, I wanna encourage you to build loving relationships with those who are deceived. Now, this is really important, church. Those who are deceived, they are not the enemy. They might seem to be fighting for the enemy. They might seem to be on the other side of the enemy lines. But I want you to know that God loves them. God cares about them. And we're called as believers to love them and to to build relationships with those on the other side of the fence so that we can lovingly encourage them and point them to truth. And number six, don't be intimidated into silence. Here's one of the, the sneakiest tricks of the world right now. The world wants you to believe that if you offend someone, you are not showing love. And we as believers, well, we want to show love to people. So we're like, well, if, if I'm offending people, then I can't be loving them, so I better not offend anybody. Well, I want you to know the gospel is highly offensive. The gospel says that all people are broken and that they need something outside of themselves to be restored back to perfection. That's highly offensive to a lot of people. And yet we're called to go out there and share the gospel. We're called to go out there and sometimes the words that come out of your mouth, the words that you type, the words that you say, the words that you, whatever, sometimes, guess what? They're gonna be offensive. People aren't gonna like everything you have to say. And don't let the world trick you into thinking that that isn't loving. Listen, if one of you were in the middle of Aqua Heart Road after church and you were wearing noise-canceling headphones and you had your back to a semi-truck barreling down Aqua Heart Road right at you, and I saw the truck not slowing down. It was just coming at you faster and faster. And you're completely oblivious to the fact that you're about to get killed. I love you enough that if I saw that happening, I'd start running at you full speed and I would tackle you to the ground outside of the way of that semi-truck. Now you're gonna, you're gonna get some bloody scrapes. You're gonna hurt a little bit. You're probably gonna look up at me and be super confused. I thought you were the loving pastor. Why'd you just hurt me? Sometimes we gotta... We gotta push people out of the way of a semi-truck. Don't be afraid to say what God's put on your heart to say. Make sure you do it though, balancing truth with grace. We're not just called out there to hit people over the head with truth. We wanna balance it with love and grace. Let me wrap up with this, this last quote from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Here's one of the things he says in the book. He says this, in war, the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won. Whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and then afterwards looks for victory. Let me tell you what this means before I explain why I included it here. What Sun Tzu is saying is you don't want to even enter a war until you already have a strategy in place, you already have the people in place, you have the plan in place to know that you're going to win it. You don't go into a war and then say, all right, well, we picked a fight. Now let's figure out how we're going to win this thing. He says, if you do it that way, you're going to be defeated every time. You have to already know that you're going to be victorious. Well, here's the good news, believer. The Bible's really clear that the victory has already been won. Right? You are already on the side of the victor. And so we're going to go into this war knowing that because the battle has already been won, we're not just in a war where we're wondering what the outcome is going to be. The battle has already been won. And so let's be careful how we fight. Let's make sure we know who the enemy is. Let's make sure that when we're dealing with people that we'd love to be part of our team, that we're showing truth and grace but that we're standing firmly on truth in our families. Let's not let our families be infiltrated, deceived. Let's not be divided and conquered. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the encouragement you've given to us out of it today, that we have to recognize that our families are under attack, that we have the ability to to recognize the strategy of the enemy and to attack the strategy. We have the ability to make sure that no infiltration happens to make sure we're not deceived, to make sure that our families and our churches and our, our as a body of believers, that we're not divided so that we 
won't be easily conquered. God, we know that this battle has already been won. We thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.